Hi, I'm Rhiannon McRae, the editor for Trends in Genetics. I'm here with Bing Ren, who's from UCSD and also at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Um, we are here at the 80th Symposia at Cold Spring Harbor, and the, the symposia is called 21st Century Genetics, Genes at Work. But Bing's, the title of your talk the other day was called Enhancers at Work. So do you want to maybe just introduce enhancers and how are they related to, to gene regulation? The answer to the concept was um, defined in the early 80s. Um, they, discovered, they were discovered as a class of elements that can uh, activate genes from a distance in an orientation independent manner. Um, and quickly over the last several decades, a number of enhancers were discovered to play instrumental roles in regulating developmental spe uh, stage specific uh, gene expression. Um, for example, babe lobin mm -hmm. um, regulation is controlled by an enhancer that uh, had been well studied. Mm -hmm. So, this class of elements uh, now have been associated with. Uh, the function of uh, controlling uh, the spatial and temporal specific expansion of, uh, of um, most human genes uh, in the body. Uh, the problem with the enhancer is that for the longest time, how many there are, where they are in the genome, and how they function has uh, been largely a mystery. So okay, so you said that these could be far away from the gene, so I can imagine that you don't even really know where to start looking to find these enhancers? Yes, uh, and that's why for many years uh, we don't really know where enhancers are and how many there are. And it's only in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years uh, do we begin to appreciate the magnitude um, and the landscape of the enhancer. Uh, we now know there are millions of uh, such sequences in a human genome, mm -hmm. and together they may uh, constitute as much as more than 12% of the genome, um, which is al already um, fivefold more than all the protein coding sequences combined. Right, right. So they obviously play a major yeah. role. So how were these million enhancers identified? So uh, technologies um, in the last few years have undergone tremendous uh, progress, um, mainly thanks to the development of uh, high throughput DNA sequencing mm -hmm. technologies, and in conjunction with the uh, molecular biology tools uh, such as uh, chromatin modification mapping, mm -hmm. DNA hypersensitive yep. site mapping, um, and DNA methylation uh, mapping at high resolution. So mm -hmm. these tools are uh, instrumental in helping us defining. Mm -hmm. candidate enhancers in multiple cell types and in multiple developmental stages. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and also NIH has played a major role in that effort. There have been several large-scale uh, efforts, uh, namely the ENCODE project. Mm -hmm. Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. That's right, Encyclopedia of DNA Element. Mm -hmm. um, and also the uh, Common Fund uh, Roadmap Epigenome mm -hmm. Project, which mm -hmm. are um, allow group of scientists working together in a uh, coordinated manner uh, and generated uh, high quality across the board mm -hmm. data sets that eventually led to the current understanding of the landscape. Okay, I'm going to step back just for a second. So when you were talking about these technologies and developments, you mentioned a couple things that are related to chromatin. So you mentioned DNA methylation, um, histone modifying enzymes. So how does that fit in with identifying enhancers? So are enhancers essentially a sort of a subset of chromatin? Do they have kind of a hallmark that was used to, to sort yeah. of mark them as candidate enhancers? enhancers? Are sequence, they are very hard to identify from sequence alone because mm -hmm. they don't carry very typical motifs that you could easily identify mm -hmm. from the sea of sequences. Mm -hmm. What uh, my lab realized about um, eight years ago was that enhancers carry unique chromatin modification patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and the such patterns uh, 
now we know are caused by uh, a whole set of uh, machinery that includes both sequence-specific transmission factor binding to the sequence mm -hmm. and uh, recruitment of uh, histone-modifying proteins that create this unique pattern. And by finding this pattern, we now actually have the tool to recognize the enhancer sequences, not by DNA sequence, but by chromatin modification okay. pattern. All right. So now you've so you've, you're able to go through and identify these sequences throughout the genome. So and I, I assume you've done this in humans and mice and probably actually quite a few cell lines maybe. We, uh, and also my uh, uh, collaborators, uh, both within the Encode Consortium and mm -hmm. the Roadmap Consortium, has taken have taken this uh, approach to uh, to apply to hundreds of cell types in the human. Wow. And uh, uh, multiple developmental stages, as well as uh, cell types in the mouse. Mm -hmm. So uh, there have been a series of uh, uh, reports on the discovery of uh, this type of elements over the last few years. So can you maybe give us a little bit of insight on what has emerged from, you know, you've, you've found them, but you could, you're could you also seeing, you know, what do they look like in different organisms, or like you said, over developmental time. So are there some general rules that look like they're coming out of here? I mean. What, what have we learned, really, about enhancers from our ability to identify them genome-wide? We have learned tremendously over the last just short uh, five years. Number one, we know that enhancers are highly specific for each tissue or cell types. They are regulated mm -hmm. in a, a temporal, controlled manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, uh, from uh, the group of enhancers that display cell or developmental stage-specific uh, activities, we can infer uh, transcription factors that um, uh, determine or utilize enhancers mm -hmm. for driving uh, gene expression programs. Um, and thirdly, uh, the uh, discovery of these enhancers provide an enormously valuable tool for us to understand um, the genetic basis of human disease. Uh, this is uh, basically a par there is a parallel research effort going on in the genetics community that link uh, sequence variations to a common human uh, disease. Mm -hmm. And it was found that majority or vast majority of those sequence polymorphisms are located in non-coding part of the okay. DNA. So until a few years ago, we uh, did not have any idea what these non-coding sequences may do. Mm -hmm. But now because of the annotation of these candidate enhancers, the hypothesis now becomes this non-coding uh, variants may disrupt enhancer function mm -hmm. uh, and consequently cause uh, the uh, misregulation of gene. And that is now become the major mm -hmm. hypothesis for people to pursue in multiple uh, yep. fields. So, I mean, when you, you, know, you think about that, so you maybe see a variation in a regulatory region and now we're able to say that this region looks like an enhancer, but how do you know what gene it's regulating? That's I mean, if, again, the, if the enhancer could be really far away or... That's the major question we all face today. Um, so from um, limited examples, we know that enhancer can act over a long distance. The champion of that is uh, a enhancer that it turned out to control the uh, a developmental regulator uh, underlying uh, limb development called Sonic Hedgehog. It's over a million base pair away from the enhancer. So that's as <coughs> that's a very long distance. Yeah. So we don't really have any predictive tool today that uh, allow us to predict this in non-coding sequence mm -hmm. control certain gene. There are uh, several approaches that people have taken. One of them is uh, to identify the physical interactions between. Uh, enhancer mm -hmm. and uh, a candidate target gene mm -hmm. uh, because the theory is that when enhancer function from a distance it undergo a configuration uh, reconfiguration such as the promoter mm -hmm. enhancers are in uh, close proximity okay and this um, in largely thanks to um, the development of so-called quantum conformation capture mm -hmm. techniques, now we can capture such proximity and uh, identify them mm -hmm. genome-wide. So uh, now uh, this genome-wide 
chromosome conformation capture mm -hmm. strategies really helped us beginning to understand the uh, long-range mm -hmm. quality interactions between enhancers and promoters, which will help us define target genes mm -hmm. of those non-coding sequences. It seems like that will also, so, you know, if I, I'm imagining you know, your enhancers were here, your gene is here, and they may be brought together. It seems like they would maybe only be brought together when that gene was actually being regulated, which also seems that you're going to get some tissue-specific information out of that 3C, this chromosome confirmation capture. In addition to, you know, you, you may identify the gene, but then you also may know, okay, it's active in this tissue. But if you look in a different tissue and you don't see that interaction, would that then suggest that that enhancer is not functioning in that other tissue? So um, that would be a uh, what I would have thought in the beginning. But uh, as we accumulate more and more data, we realize that the... Uh, regulation is uh, not as simple as what you just laid out. <laughs> uh, what happened is that the long-range chromatin interactions between enhancers and promoters are um, regulated at a higher level by a structure, what we call topological domains. Mm -hmm. So these are defined based upon long-range chromatin interactions, um, genome-wide fashion, um, and these domains uh, uh, basically are the unit of quantum folding. Okay. So apparently in most cell types, they fold in such unit in an invariable uh, fashion. So the uh, units are constant okay. in every cell type. Okay. Apparently, this unit is not uh, dependent on having the gene on or off. Oh, okay. So each unit consists uh, of roughly 8 to 10 genes, so it's a MAC-based long mm -hmm. sequence. Um, and they are quite conserved also. We found that they exist um, in uh, other organisms, in mm -hmm. mouse and in flies and in many other species. Uh, and uh, if you compare the syntactic regions of mouse and human, you find that the uh, topological domains are uh, amazingly conserved. So, so such large regions being so conserved imply that they play a fundamental role mm -hmm. in yeah. uh, chromatin folding. And I um, and others in the field uh, believe that the, one of those functions is to constrain enhancer-promoter mm -hmm. interactions mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that um, uh, an enhancer only pick certain genes to in turn down, but not randomly mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the genome. Uh, but you are also right in the sense that the specifically when a gene is turned on, enhancers are uh, more likely to be in um, interacting mm -hmm. with that promoter. Um, and that interaction, um, how it's formed and how stable it is and what mechanism is there to maintain it, uh, still needs to be figured Open out. Open question. So still, still a lot more to do, even though, but it seems like we have a lot of the tools and we can really start asking some interesting questions about these enhancers now and how yes. they function. Okay. I'd like to end by asking you a question I've asked everyone because we are uh, also celebrating 150 years of Mendel's Laws of Inheritance. So do you remember learning about these or the first time that you did a Punnett square where you, you know, you did the, with the cross and you could see the progeny? Do you remember learning this? I remember learning it in high school, biology, mm -hmm. and that was one of the reasons that got me interested in uh, biology. I, I, prior to that, I thought biology are observing and uh, anatomy. Uh, I, I didn't realize that it involved uh, mass mm -hmm. in such Just a degree, quantitative. Yeah. and I actually, uh, personally, I, I'm interested in understanding numbers, I'm mm -hmm. comfortable with numbers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, seeing this uh, uh, Mendel's Law uh, in such a simplistic fashion really stimulate my interest in biology. That's awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.